Welcome to Conversations with Ken, a podcast where we discuss relevant topics in investing. I'm Ken Crawford, Senior Portfolio Manager with Argent Capital Management. Hello, this is Ken Crawford with Argent Capital Management, Portfolio Manager with another installment of our Argent Podcasts. With me today and uh, someone who has been a guest a few times is Kirk McDonald. Kirk McDonald, for people who have listened before, will recognize that he is the mid-cap portfolio manager at Argent Capital. Uh, Kirk, please say hello. Hi, everybody. Kirk McDonald. Glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to bring Kirk here to talk about um, what happened in 2022 and perhaps look into the crystal ball for 2023 in a and again, um, focus more on the economy. So the last time we met, the three big subjects that we talked about um, with regard to the economy were supply chain, where we had China um, having issues and we had ports here in in the US being clogged, Uh, war in Ukraine, which uh, certainly continues today, uh, and then inflation. So, what what happened, Kirk, throughout the year with those and any other topics that you thought were noteworthy? And then what do you think is going to happen in 2023? Yeah, so I'll start off with talking about the supply chain issues. And it, it was really interesting. I looked and it was exactly a year ago today that we released that, released that podcast talking about supply chain. So that was December 2nd, 2021. And here we're recording this on December 2nd, 2022. And, I and to interrupt, uh, the, the noteworthy event was Kirk had no oven. Yeah, and I had, that's exactly right. I had no oven. And so that is proof positive, actually, that supply chain issues are improving because I finally got an oven in mid-March of 2022. But it took 15 months uh, waiting a back order. And I actually didn't get the oven I originally ordered. I had to settle for just another oven that got that was ready but I paid 35% more for that oven, even though it wasn't as good as the one I originally ordered because of inflation, which is another topic we'll talk about today. But that was proof that the supply chain problems were starting to ease finally when I was able to get an oven. And now I have a feeling you could probably just go and buy one and take it home today. Um, But it was funny when we talked last December, I mentioned there were 76 ships sitting off the ports of Los right. Angeles and Long Beach. Today, there's none, which is the normal state of the world. So there's you can ships just sail straight into Los Angeles now, which is great. So that's evidence that the supply chain is getting better. Um, and then those containers that the ships carry, right. the container rates are down 77% wow. uh, in the past year. And also trucking, so to you know, once they get off the ships, they have to typically on a train or a truck, truck freight rates are down 38%. Uh, since a year ago as well. So that's an indication that supply chains are easing. Um, It also flows into inflation that we'll talk about later because that's a sign that inflation is cooling. Um, And other signs that you can see anecdotally that um, the supply chains are easing are just pay attention when you drive by a car dealership. Earlier this year, there'd be two or three cars on the lot. It looked vacant right like they were closing parking down. lot yeah with no cars <laughs> exactly now there's you know a good number of cars and trucks to buy so uh evidence is everywhere that supply chain is is easing um it's even getting better in semiconductors which is a very cyclical industry uh has pretty high ups and downs um and they're starting a downturn right now so um because there's more semis of certain types avail- uh, available than people really need at the exact moment. So those are, um, while it makes it tough to be in the semiconductor industry, it's a good sign for the rest of us that those supply chain problems are largely a thing of the past. Not completely though, because China still uh, zero COVID. has a zero COVID policy and they're shutting, locking down various cities right. and factories and things like that. But uh, companies are diversifying their supply chains outside of China. I was gonna ask, are you seeing evidence of nearshoring or shoring away from China, or what, what's going on there? There's definitely evidence of nearshoring, um, and it's also being encouraged by the U.S. government. Really, um, the uh, Chips Act, right, fifty-five billion dollars right. in subsidies um, to build semiconductor manufacturing here in the United States, and there's been several multi-billion-dollar plants announced in uh, different states around the the nation. Right. Taiwan Semi in Arizona. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Samsung, you know, is building a big plant. Intel is investing huge in a couple of different states as well. And that's all 
big, I think, positive for Americans. It's jobs in the United States, and it keeps that manufacturing ability here, which is actually which is critical for national security right. as well to keep that know-how at home. But the nearshoring trend is definitely is is for real, actually, and um, um, non-residential construction is still on the upswing. It's still doing it's still doing quite strong, and nearshoring is part of the reason hmm. for hmm. that. Okay. And obviously, uh, some of the concerns about the economy with higher inflation and what the Fed is doing, seeing that uh, commercial real estate doing strong, uh, an indication that it's kind of bucking the trend. Yeah, yes, it, it is definitely bucking the trend. And so the Fed has, uh, as we're all well, pretty well aware, has been raising interest rates most of this year uh, up, to the, up to about 4% right now in the short-term rate. And their whole reason for doing that is to cool inflation. Right. Um, and the market reacted tremendously positively two days ago. Chairman right. Jay Powell of the Federal Reserve Board gave a speech, and he acknowledged, I see inflation cooling. And people said, oh, thank goodness. And he acknowledged that the pace of rate hikes would slow. He guaranteed that they'll do another half a percent rate hike on December 14th. Right. I think Coming is the name up. of the next meeting. But then he said that they would be more data dependent after that. Um, and, and control the pace of hikes going forward. It wouldn't be as fast. So Wall Street really, really liked to hear that because the big fear is that the Fed will induce a recession in order to break inflation's back, much like uh, Paul Volcker did back right. in the early 1980s. Um, and we have right now a classic situation that indicates the recession could be 12 months out, and that's the inverted yield curve. Right. Where that the short-term rates that the, where the Fed's pushed them up to 4% now are higher than the rate to borrow money 10 years for for the 10-year U.S. Treasury, and that's an inverted yield curve, um, and it's led 100% of the time to a recession about a year later. But it does have to stay inverted, the, most of the research shows, for about two quarters, about six months. Um, and we've been inverted now for a month, roughly. So it's not too late, um, and even Chairman Powell was quite uh, favorable in his outlook for the economy. He said there's a good chance that we could have a softish landing, meaning avoid a bad recession. Uh, which really cheered people on, frankly. And one of the uh, problems that the Fed is having is, as they try to combat inflation, employment continues to be very, very strong. Yet Powell seemed to indicate that he didn't think that labor pressures were pushing up inflation. Any any thoughts there? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and we had another report out this morning right. on labor that was that was probably too hot. Right. Um, and average hourly earnings were actually up um, about 5% year on year, which is higher than what you'd like to see. And that's the one area where we still see inflation. And normally I say that's a good thing. I'd like to see people getting paid Get more, more right. all the time. Uh, but it is a risk right now that that could keep the inflation rate, underlying inflation rate higher. However, that 5% growth in earnings is still way lower than what we saw back in the last inflation bout in the 1970s. So it's possible that it still won't be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, and keep inflation endemic. Um, but it is probably the biggest risk right now is that very too strong labor economy. Right. However, those reports are backwards looking. And right now in real time, we get we hear uh, announcements of layoffs right. nearly every single day from huge companies in the United States. So it does show that the employment picture is weakening, uh, but it's still hanging in there pretty strong. Yeah, one of the uh, market pundits uh, from Morgan Stanley, who has been more right than wrong, suggested that perhaps this go around, you would see stickier uh, labor because it's been so difficult for companies to hire. But to your point, layoffs from large companies, I figure that has to provide some kind of safety net for companies that might be thinking of layoffs but might be reluctant when they see Apple, when they see Google, when they see Twitter laying off people. Um, if those companies are doing it, then you know my small company, more likely than not, will, will follow suit. So uh, that, you know, it, it, good for uh, wage inflation, obviously not so good if you're one of the people who gets the pink slip. Exactly, exactly. The, but the positive news is the unemployment rate is still low at 3.7. Right. Right. So right now, most of those people are probably pretty quickly able to replace their job with another good one. 
And then the other topic we talked about, war in Ukraine, what's going on there and, and what are the implications for the economy? So the war in Ukraine was one of the things that contributed to inflation this year. There, there was many other things, um, but that was one of the things because it um, made grain supplies tighter initially because right. um, uh, Ukraine is a big su- exporter. I think around 10% of the world's wheat plus um, sunflower and several other, other commodities that they grow there. Uh, but fortunately, a deal was was made earlier this year to allow grain exports out of Ukraine. So that's helped to ease some of the pressures on food prices. And in fact, Kroger's reported the other day that you know food inflation is slowing hmm. from their perspective. So that's a big Kroger's a big grocery chain right, right. for those uh, who aren't aware. Um, so that's that's all positive. The other thing that it has contributed a little bit to is tighter energy supplies, right. natural gas and oil. And it has put a, Russia. a bid or a floor under those prices. Uh, Russia so far has been able to export um, oil, but um, it is starting to build up a little bit. There's about a million dollar, million barrels a day recently that they haven't been able to sell. Um, while that's bad, it will keep oil prices higher. It's good because it, it pressures Russia to end uh, their war in Ukraine. Uh, and then natural gas is also tightened up. And right. that's voluntarily. Europe said... You know, Russia A was cutting off supplies, and Europe said, okay, fine, we're not going to buy it from you and finance your war in Ukraine. So they've been looking to other suppliers, and the United States has really been the big supplier in the near term of their of their natural gas. In fact, Chenier Energy, which is a mid-cap stock that we own. Uh, ticker LNG. Ticker LNG, liquefied natural gas. It's a good ticker, but they're in a sweet spot. They are The United States is the largest exporter of natural gas right now, and... Um, Chenier Energy is the largest exporter of natural gas, uh, excuse me, liquefied natural gas right. in the United States. So they're in a really good position. They used to send about 30 to 40 percent of their cargoes to Europe. Uh, now they've been sending 70 percent of their cargoes to Europe. Uh, so they've really helped to, to make up that gap. Um, and they're in a good position. It's provided them with cash flow. They've announced several um, capacity increases, which do take years to come online. Right. But uh, it's a good business opportunity for them, and it will keep the people in Europe uh warm hopefully in the wintertime and chevron a uh, name and dividend select has been talking about moving some of its natural gas from asia where it's got large fields in australia to europe and they through their acquisition of noble energy have uh gas fields in the mediterranean which would be well positioned to, to um, satisfy some of the needs of Europe for natural gas. So, and that's one of my favorite names for a natural gas field. There is off in the Mediterranean Sea is Leviathan. Leviathan, right? Uh, okay, so we've kind of laid down what happened this year. What are people thinking about next year, and and how do you expect it all to play out? Okay, so one thing I'll posit my remarks by saying I guarantee what I tell you will be wrong. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have not mastered predicting the future. Although I try every single day. Wow, uh, 15 months waiting for an oven. I mean. <laughs> so in 2023, uh, we, we see a couple of things playing out you know, in the near term. Number one, the economy is definitely slowing down. There are signs all around us. So things that measure manufacturing and services are slowing down. So the manufacturing purchasing managers index right. is below 50, meaning right. things are contracting. Contracting, there. right. Um, we see that def- as a big sign. We see we talked about those layoff announcements. So it shows the job market is cooling down. So the economy is undoubtedly slowing, and that is positively helping to slow the rate of inflation. So we see the economy definitely starting to slow for probably the first nine months of 2023. Uh, but then after that, as long as inflation continues to cool, the Fed will be able to pause interest rates and then possibly late in 2023 start to cut their interest rates again to reaccelerate the economy. And that, that right now is the general set of conditions that we see playing out. And that's a big positive for the stock market because the stock market is a leading indicator of the economy. Right. It leads it by six months or so. So that's part of the reason the stock market is starting to go up already in anticipation of better times starting in late 2023. So as investors, um, my recommendation is is um, to stay invested and keep saving your money and investing it for the long run. Um, and the situation that we find ourselves in right now actually is a very good technical setup in terms of following a midterm election. Right. Um, 16 out of the last 16 times, going all the way back to 1960, the stock market has been higher a year after the midterm elections. So it's a very positive setup from that standpoint. 
And as most well. people, I believe, are, are happy with gridlock, um, with the House and the Senate split between Democrats and Republicans. Yes. So there's lots of data. Obviously, people have looked back empirically and seen who is better for the economy. Is it a Republican in the mm-hmm. White House or mm-hmm. a Democrat? And in fact, they're, or who's better for the stock market? It's exactly the same. It doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or Republican in the White House. Um, but the best combination would be one party in the White House and a different party controlling the right. legislative branch. And you do get a little bit better stock market returns than there. So you hate to say that gridlock is the best outcome, but it seems to be economically a pretty good one. Okay. Well, with that as a backdrop uh, for 2023 and a look back at 2022, and Kirk's oven in place and and baking things uh, will sign off. This is Ken Crawford, Portfolio Manager at Argent Capital, and Kirk McDonald, Portfolio Manager of the Argent Midcap Strategy. Uh, Wishing you all happy holidays, happy new year, and we'll talk to you in 2023. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Ken. For now, stay safe, stay well, and thank you for investing your time with us. This podcast represents opinions from portfolio managers of Argent Capital Management, LLC, a registered investment advisor, and reflect the portfolio manager's judgment on the date of this podcast and are subject to change. The podcast is meant for informational purposes only, is not intended to serve as a recommendation to buy or sell any security. It is also not a research report and is not intended to serve as a basis for any investment decision. All investments involve risk, and the past performance of a security or financial product does not guarantee future results or returns. Investors should consider their investment objectives and risk carefully before investing.